Hey guys. Well, it's finally time to start working on the Sharp SG618 surface grinder. And the first thing I want to do is replace this X-axis cable traverse. And I actually shot this footage a while ago, but the internal audio on my camcorder has gotten so bad due to internal camera noise because it's old that I've needed to shoot this uh, voiceover. And it's getting harder and harder for me to get time where I'm alone in the house and I can do voiceover recording. So I apologize. Uh, kind of left you hanging for a few weeks, but... Uh, I'm excited to get this uh, up and running. So the first thing I'm going to do is remove the tension drum over here on the left side of the table. You'll notice uh, that it comes right off with a cap screw. And this is definitely not a factory replacement cable. Uh, it's got blue uh, painter's tape wrapped around the end. But I am going to use this cable as a measurement to try and figure out uh, what cable to replace it with. You'll also notice that there is a second tapped hole. The one closest to us, I think, is the new one. The one on the back doesn't feel stripped out, but it must have been stripped out or else why would they drill and tap a second hole? Over here on the right side, you can see uh, this appears to be some hardware store repair because in the manual, uh, in the parts manual, it actually lists another tension drum over here on the right side of the table. And that makes sense based on the instructions for how to create the cable tension because you need to be able to take some measurements and uh, you're not able to do it with this current setup. So you can tell that's a homemade bracket up there and then just a bent eye bolt. Um, I do intend to remake the original piece. I don't think I'm gonna buy one. Um, I, I haven't even contacted Sharp. I don't know if it's available, but I think I'm gonna replace this. However, you'll notice the difference here is that the bolt drops down through the top. So here on the right side of the table, again, uh, that's that cap screw. And so the tension drum must uh, somehow be fastened from uh, from above and I'm not really sure how that works unless there's also a nut. I need to check the parts manual again But I wanted to show you that over here on the left side. That's definitely not the case because if you remove the uh, spark shield uh, With just these two small cap screws. You'll notice that there's no uh, bolt coming through the top It's just the one coming through the bottom that I showed you a moment ago all right, over here on the bench, uh, you can see I've taken a 7 30 seconds transfer punch, and that fit perfectly uh, in the hole that goes through the bottom of the drum. And then the nut part has a requires a pin spanner, and I don't have one that's the right size. So the one that's too big uh, could just shim with a piece of half-inch aluminum, and uh, yeah, it worked really well. It actually wasn't on there very tight, and you'll see that in reassembly, I actually tighten it uh, quite a bit more than this. So the cable ended up being uh, 5 30 seconds, which I think I show you with the calipers here in a few minutes. So 5 30 seconds in diameter. And then the reason why I'm taking it apart is because I wanted to get a strand count to find out uh, how many strands were in this cable. Now I'd already ordered some replacement cable from McMaster. And what I went with was an 18.8 stainless steel pre-lubricated and it's called a 719 cable, which means seven major strands and 19 wires making up each of those seven strands. So when I took this apart or when I frayed it right here, I was counting to find out if I was gonna end up being close. And it ended up being the exact same cable. So whoever replaced this cable in the past, um, I don't know whether or not they got it from McMaster, but they bought the exact same cable that I bought. McMaster lists this as their ultra flexible stainless steel cable. So I thought it was gonna work. And I had some debate on what cable to go with because uh, one of my buddies that has a surface grinder told me that his cable is very, very similar to the stuff I ended up ordering and what was already on my machine. Another friend told me that his has a coated cable, and I was able to find another surface grinder online, I think a Kent brand uh, surface grinder, that also listed in their parts uh, website as... Uh, a coated cable and then I had another person hit me up on YouTube telling me that they had a coated cable on theirs and instead of being a large diameter like this and I'll show you why I went with this diameter in a couple of minutes um, but they said that theirs was something like a 16th inch diameter cable and then with the coating it was more like an eighth of an inch and on McMaster that checks out that gives you a very tight bend radius so if anybody else has an opinion on this I'd love for you to chime in I'm not afraid to spend another 20 bucks and order another 10 feet of cable uh, 10 feet is enough that I'll be able to replace this at least a couple of times you can see how flexible it is here it, it really is pretty nice stuff uh, but it was like $20 for the cable the ferrule uh, the clamp and uh, shipping, so really pretty inexpensive. But I think it's gonna work. Uh, the only thing that could really go bad is if it wears out the, uh, the drum that drives the cable. And as you'll see here in just a minute, when this cable's wrapped around that drum, it fits very, very nicely. Underneath the table, over here on the right side, this is just standard uh, cable uh, <laughs> loop creating, I mean, I mean loop 
cable fastening. I don't know what you call it. Uh, I did go with a little bit nicer stainless steel clamp that I uh, got from McMaster with the cable. And then I didn't show it in this footage, but there's also uh, stainless steel ferrule. I choked up on the cable quite a bit and got the ferrule installed too. So this is a little bit nicer than the stuff you might get at your hardware store, but it basically does the exact same thing. And like I said, eventually I'd like to replace it with the uh, factory style drum. Over here on the left side, you can see the drum that does the driving. And I'm going to refer to this as a screw because that's basically how it functions. There is a specific procedure, and that's what I'm doing right here. You'll notice that I'm looping the cable from the outside to the inside. If you just wind the cable up onto the drum, when you turn the hand wheel, the cable will try to climb over itself. Each loop will try to climb over the, the loop next to it because of the direction of the screw. So you do have to do it this way. This is how it describes it in the parts manual. It made it sound like it was going to be way more difficult than it actually was. But uh, yeah, it does take a little bit of, of uh, fussing and sorting around. But once you get it set up on there, um, in my case, I had the table centered and then I centered the cable on the screw. And you'll see in a couple of minutes here that that actually worked out really well. So I came to this cable size by two methods. First, by uh, using the calipers to measure the width of the cable, but then also taking transfer punches and laying it up there on that uh, drum to see what the radius of each thread was. And the radius was 5.30 seconds, so, um, or uh, 5.64, I guess. So 5.30 seconds uh, diameter cable ended up being perfect for the situation. And that's why I think a smaller cable maybe wouldn't work as well. It wouldn't make as much contact. Maybe you'd have to have more tension to uh, get it to not slip. I'm not really sure. And finally, or maybe almost finally, uh, over here on the left side, you can see uh, that it basically takes one wrap uh, to capture the cable and then just a couple more wraps around the drum uh, to help secure it. Now, you do have to wind from the bottom up, as you can see here. That way, as you tension the cable by turning the drum counterclockwise, uh, it will... Um, wrap itself around the drum even further. So I think I ended up with two full wraps around the drum and in the picture it, in the parts manual it showed three wraps. Uh, but this ended up working out pretty well. Now the one thing is I actually thought it would be smarter to wind the cable clockwise so that as you tighten that cap screw it would also add tension to the drum. But that ended up not being the right way to do it because of the way the cable comes off of that driving screw. So the right thing to do here was uh, the way the manual recommended. And then what I used to tighten it is just that 7.30 seconds uh, transfer punch that I would put through the bottom holes. I would pull and add tension on the left while uh, tightening the screw on the right. And that seemed to work pretty well. Of course, that nut on top does need to be captured first. And uh, that was kind of its own pain because... Uh, it's just hard to get up there and and get that to uh, to get that tight. So what I'm using here is that transfer punch on the nut, and then you can see here I've just got a T-handled Allen key on the uh, on the drum itself, and that allowed me to get it tight. And I was able to tighten it quite a bit more than how it was tightened when I originally um, when I when I took it apart, but not so tight that it crushed the cable. And I really don't think it needs to be tight enough to crush the cable. I think it's going to get the job done here. And uh, yeah, so that ended up being pretty straightforward. And the last thing we need to look at is adding tension to the cable. And to do the tension, we're back over here on the right. You can see that there's a ruler laying on top of the cable and I'm using a scale to measure how much the cable is sagging. And on that string, I've got four and a half pounds. It asks for 2.2 kilograms in the manual. And that uh, 2.2 kilograms is supposed to be something like 210 millimeters from the tensioning drum. Of course, we don't have the tensioning drum anymore. We have this homemade bracket and this eye bolt assembly. So we're really not getting an accurate measurement of how much tension is on there. And I think I may actually have just a smidge too much. There is zero slippage in the cable, and I'm gonna show you that in just a minute, but I don't wanna over tension it and wear the cable out prematurely. According to the manual, that's what happens if you over tension it. So you can see here when I move the table all the way to the right, the cable wraps itself up the screw. There's still about two wraps behind the cable that you can't see, or rather two threads. So it, it's not too far uh, up the drum and then as I move the table all the way to the left we're about a thread and a half from falling off so we know that we're not too far um, out on the uh, on the screw so you can see here the cable is kind of sagging that's me pulling on the hand wheel to try and feel um, whether or not it slips it didn't and I think for the last cut I'll go back to the uh, in-camera audio and show you uh, the whole thing in action 
All right, so here's a top-down view. I still need to move these stops out so that I can bump into those before hitting the uh, end of the travel on the table. So right here, it looks like it goes a, just a quarter inch past uh, the edge of the y-axis and on this direction, actually same thing. So uh, I can actually look right at the ends of the table and that works pretty well. So it's not very smooth, but it also hasn't been oiled. But I think you can see the whole thing is gonna work out pretty well. Uh, I can definitely tell from here that I will be able to cover the entire 18 inch chuck. So that's pretty exciting. And uh, yeah, the next step will be getting power to it. That's actually tomorrow's project. We'll see if I get time to work on it. And then we'll get to hear this thing fire up for the first time. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you in the next one.